Hello survivors and welcome back to our Resident Evil Village podcast. This is part two, the concluding chapter in this mega podcast. Make sure you listen to part one first where we talk about the settings and locations of the game as well as gameplay. But with that out of the way, without any further ado, this is part two of Resident Evil Village. Greetings, I'm Albert Wesker. You're listening to the First Aid Spray Podcast. All right, let's do enemies before we do characters. Um, and again, another one of those things where you look at Seven. I feel like I'm being the, the Capcom shill in this one. It's just a, a great example of them listening to the fan base, I think. With Seven, one of its um, biggest complaints was that it didn't have any enemy variety. And I think Village obviously solves that problem. Big time. Um, but I don't think it goes too far either. There's a few base enemy types to crop up. You've got your bigger ones like Lycans with the helmets on and stuff. Um, and then a few different variations in stuff like the factory. But it doesn't go too mental with it. And there's, a, there's you know, obviously various boss fights as well. Overall, I was, I'm was i really happy with the, the, the enemies in this game. Partly also because they actually get some reasoning. At least a little bit. Which, you know, has always been a bugbear for me. Um, most of them have at least some reason for being, which makes sense. So it's easier for me to understand and believe them and to actually care about them to the point where, yeah, you know, as we pointed out, more Iker and stuff like that. I've, this time I've made sure I want to memorize the, the names for this because six was just, there were so many enemies with so many names that I don't still don't know. Uh, but with this one, I was like, cool, I'm going to learn the names and the pronunciations for all of these. Yeah, overall, pretty positive. And as I said, I was going to talk about the optional bosses. We'll just tuck this in with enemies. Um, loved that they even existed, you know. Uh, I fought the the regular, the giant. Um, but I didn't come across Otto, which I thought was spectacular, like optional boss that you could just run past. Um, and also the, the Alpha Varkolak, which is the big werewolf. Completely missed out the first time as well. Uh, which was a nice fun challenge the second time around. I just love that those things are there if you want to go after them. But if you're doing a speed run, just breeze straight past. That's really cool. Um, James, how do you feel about the the enemies? Let's not talk about bosses just yet. Let's just talk about enemies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the enemy design to go from Resident Evil Seven to this game is uh, yeah is quite something. <laughs> in yeah. regards to just monsters uh we are very spoiled um there's like several different kinds of lichen there's the moriaka there's the, the samka there's the urias like we really had a handfuls with this game like the subtypes and categories of creatures looked so great as well um and they all had like tons of work done to them Mm. Um, again, it still works as you were just mentioning still works in the universe because of the history that you're constantly given um about these monsters yeah pretty much um, all of them have like at least a file that gives some information yeah like a, like why they're there like the first time you meet mori acres like it's because you know they've been experimented on in the dungeon you know and then you meet you know you get kind of npc slash monster mm. in ingrid you know when you meet when you you find her uh, necklace yeah it's great like <laughs> that alpha took me i remember when i faced him first time um, I had my Wolfsbane. It took all of my bullets from my Wolfsbane plus <laughs> three slugs from my Sig. Like, it, that thing was so tanky and so terrifying because I think the thing that made it more terrifying was the long grass. Like, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, love the enemy design in this game. It's so nice. I feel completely, I felt completely spoiled. I felt, oh, what's going to happen next? What's going to, you know, what's, what's going to happen now? I think. If if I was like it, I, I like to hear everybody else's opinions as well. Like if you're gonna pick like a an enemy that was the most annoying to fight in terms of like their techniques and their like what their skill set was, like I think the bats, even though they die in one shot, they were super annoying. The Samka, yeah, 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 that was gonna <laughs> be my pick as well. The Samka just because the flying enemies are just irritating. I love the design, yeah. I really do, but they are irritating. Yeah, and like the way they chaotically kind of move around with every flap, they kind of move in a different direction. Mm. Like, fortunately, though, we didn't get any. Well, I mean, we got big dogs, big dog enemies, but we didn't get any dog enemies. That's you know, true. Because those things, like dog enemies, just like do my head and mm. <laughs> I can't freaking hit those things. Uh, but yeah, I love the enemy design in this game. 
actually, it's, you just mentioned something that I completely forgot. Um, talking about performance, the only time I had a a actual what could it, I guess be described as a game breaking glitch is on that second playthrough when I fought the Alvar Kolak. Um, well, what I did specifically, I was pretty kitted up to take it out, so I wasn't mad that I had to do it twice. But on my first playthrough, I put down some mines to try and lead it towards them. I killed it. I tried to pick up one of the mines I'd laid down and hadn't used, and I just it wouldn't let me do it. And I walked oh. up to my treasure, and I couldn't pick that up either. And I was like, well, something's obviously happened. So I just I had to restart, um, which gladly wasn't a problem because I was I was pretty decked out by that point, and it didn't pose much of a threat. But if it was like a really tense battle, that would have been kind of upsetting to have to do it again. But yeah. that was the only like real problem that I had, and I don't know why it even happened. Um, Adam, what do you feel of the enemy roster in this game? with it i was definitely originally worried about the lichens because you know oh geez werewolves like how is that gonna be of course (laughs) yeah but they're not werewolves so um it's fine it's i was just worried that it was gonna be like vampires and werewolves and all these kinds of weird things and Mm -hmm. how is that gonna fit in but it all still i mean they're, they're not really vampires and they're not werewolves so it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, in the concept art, that it actually has a stage by stage of how the werewolves are born, um, which is very interesting. So I, I was happy with the enemy design. The the flying enemies were just the right amount of annoying that actually <laughs> hitting them felt satisfying. Um, every, and they had good they had a very good like reaction to being shot I yeah, felt like yeah. out of most of the enemies um, you know the the three daughters I guess they're not regular enemies they were a bit too similar for my liking That's it fair. could have just been it could have been one character mm. and been like oh you got her you have to get her three times or whatever you know so that was a, a bit bit of a letdown they could have characterized those a bit better mm. But generally, other than the stupid robots at the end, <laughs> I like them all. I didn't like the completely plate cut. Like, I understand it, but they looked too clean and uniform for the factory. Right. Like, if you look at the guys with the drill arms, they look like a mess. Mm-hmm. But then if you look at the completely armored ones, they kind of look like futury. Like, they've got, like, weird... But weird shapes to them, to them and yeah. shapes yeah, yeah, yeah. that, that look sci-fi makes a difference. I, I wish they looked a bit more um in line like the, when in line with yeah, everything in else character mm. right when you see the dolls um with all the knives on their little like appendages and stuff like in that little scene if you um when you first meet or, or get out of the basement and then all the dolls fly around you and they have like little mechanical arms with blades and stuff mm. Like, give me that. Give me more of that as an aesthetic as opposed to, like, here's my future soldier kind of <laughs> with a with a generator inside him. and Yeah. Like, that that was I, a bit of a letdown for me. But they were fine for, for evolution of, like, gameplay and, mm-hmm. and, like, oh, now I have to, like, use a bunch more ammo on these guys. Yeah. I think uh, I like the, the most of the soldats, as they're called, but generally I, I agree that I... The, the design of the Panzer sold out, which is the heavily armoured one. It's a little bit meh. And I, I agree with what you said earlier. I just outright don't like the jetpack ones. That was one of the first moments in the game that really took me out of it. And there's definitely more of that coming. But that that really just went, made me go, really? That's a, that's a bit much for me, the jetpack right. robots. But... Okay, fine, whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I did like Sturm, though, the, the propeller man. Um, mostly just because he reminded me of, like, just like kids when they just run around pretending to be planes. He was just like that, basically. Just run around going, and smashing into With walls. With three chainsaw blades, <laughs> yeah. I like the fact that he cut his own arms off. Yeah, like d- that, that did make me uh, laugh, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Steve, what do you think of the uh, the enemy lowdown roster? I know I was a bit critical earlier, so I do apologize. But I do genuinely like the the enemies mostly in this game. I like the the atmosphere and stuff that they they exude is great. Um, lichens in themselves, I feel like they they are that that furry step in between both Ganado and Zombie, which uh, there's that right level mm. of settling. 
in terms of just to look at. And the fact that these things, they don't want to just beat you to death. They don't want to just like, you know, they want to chomp you and they go in viscerally. Like, yes. you, you know, yeah. I, I would argue more viscerally than like the bites in the remakes. And it, it's uh, haunting. I, I too want to echo, and you know, just if you're going to do a game like this again, Capcom, optional boss fights are fantastic. The only caveat I have is that they are a bit samey. You know, giant right. dude with giant weapon. Uh, you've got four <laughs> of them in this game. Mm. Um, I think the the Alpha Vario uh, the, the the giant old wolf. Yeah. Like I would have liked to have seen more of those sprouted throughout the game. So I think there's only like three or four of those, like wolves in general. There is, and yeah. They are they're fantastically terrifying. Like the first encounter, one where the game pretty much shows you cartoonishly being pulverized. And uh, I, I felt a nice, uh, relaxing drink come down from, you know, ah, I've been scared out of my life at the Benevieta house. Oh, God, keep going with control. Ah! You know, <laughs> that kind of atmosphere is fantastic. And mm. uh, I, don't, I feel like they, they're not, not enough of them. As for the soldats, I like them. I like the fact there's a document about it that explains his process and in mm. true mad scientist fashion, revision after revision after revision. And we clearly see uh, that it's too ridiculous. He criticizes Sturm, which is hilarious. Because <laughs> quite, quite, quite rightly, it's so stupid it locked its own arms off. <laughs> but it's like a very um, ridiculous threat in terms of like a, a walking set of chainsaw blades mm. propelling at you. But you can still block it and throw it, which I find hilarious. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, criticism is a side of like, you know, some things not reacting to it. They do have a lot of atmosphere to them. And the fact that when you first see the uh, Marioka, is that how you pronounce it? Or Marioka? I got, yeah, yeah. Crawling out of the dark in the dungeons. Yeah, and you know, at first, you don't even see them at first, but then they're like silhouetted and creep in. That kind of visual is amazing. Yeah, you know wh- whether they're like you know particularly spectacular to fight. They're not meant to be. They're like a horde enemy, aren't they? Pretty um, much. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I also like the fact we've finally found a uh, another long tongued horrible beastie in the Resident Evil universe. Only it's now a liquor with wings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I- oh my god, you're right. <laughs> Uh, and it's it's pretty good. It's, it's uh, you know I, I think Adam's right on the money. They're that right level of a pain in the ass. Mm. <laughs> you know, where it's satisfying to kill them, but they're not too much of an ordeal. Mm. Um, I would argue nothing quite has that terror factor besides the the big wolves, though. For me, like mm. everything else is kind of yeah, they're fun. Yeah, uh, the lichens in hordes uh, when they're crawling and doing their thing in the den is a visual spectacle, but they they still go down pretty easy if you hit them with the old like boomstick. Mm-hmm. when i remember early game when just like that siege because it was so new and i was so panicked about what was going on i was a, a voice in the back of my head was like if, if they move like this for the whole game i'm really going to struggle and then a few hours yeah. in or whatever i was like oh I've, I've figured it out i've figured out the pattern they don't pose too much of a threat like even going back and playing that area now i, I know what to expect obviously but first for out of the gate they're a little bit terrifying because they're so new um, I think the, first impression is strong for those guys. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a great scene early on. The Moraika, mm. by the way, is the uh, there we go. sort of underground beasties. They're actually, you know, it's weird because design-wise, they're very, very simple. They're just shambling things with blades with like tattered brown robes. But I really, I visually, I think they're really, really strong. I really like them. I'd love to see more of them. Um, it's it's not going to happen. I think with, with all of these, I'd probably take a little bit more of everything. But I'm pretty sure it's all self-contained to this story, which is. A shame, I guess, but it is nice to have them here if we ever want to go back and fight these. Maybe they'll show up in like random multiplayer and mercenaries games and stuff. But um, so let's talk about zero reverse character. Here we come. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, let's talk about boss fights. Um, so the, we're probably going to get it definitely towards spoilers with this one. Obviously, uh, talking about the designs of the lords and stuff um, to start off. Uh, Alcina's dragon form was very grand. I thought it was actually strikingly you know, like an iconic kind of way uh, because it was so different. The series had never done it, and not her design necessarily, but the boss fight on top of the rooftops and the way it flies around. I was like, this is really cool. And you know, the just the visuals of the the, the time of day and everything else. I, I really like the way that whole boss fight looks and feels. Um, again doing what seven didn't and having an actual end boss at the end was nice like an actual mano a mano fight um generally though pretty happy i like the moreau fight uh but the heisenberg boss fight um well it's dog shit, isn't it <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sorry, but oh, it's it. wow. I hate it. It's Just awful. Tell people how you feel. I like I'm, you when you're not in the tank. I like you when you're not in the tank. When you're gonna do maybe it I just his design is too much for me. It's too much. It, it comes out of nowhere. I, you get in the tank and you're like, oh, this is stupid. Here we go. This is gonna be so dumb. I I'm sorry. I know some people like it, and I will pass it to James eventually. <laughs> but I've got this ball, and I'm, fe- I'm telling you now, it's bad. That the first area is the Spencer Mansion. The house. Is the dollhouse is Resident Evil Seven, <laughs> and then the Heisenberg fight is Resident Evil Six. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. I uh, I I hated it, and it was it set me down a path that I will will continue with talking about when we talk about story. But yeah, uh, uh, yeah, my heart sank when that part came up. But James, I know you loved it, so please take take the take the bat on and and tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> You're not wrong. It's it's an opinion. Opinions can't be wrong. So uh, I love that fight. It's super bombastic, and to be honest, it's exactly what I needed after um, the Dollhouse and Moreau and Urias. I needed a mm-hmm. super fun fight that I could just like. It is brain dead. Like you don't really need to do anything crazy in that fight. Um, like it's it's literally you know. I am in tank. I shoot orange weak spot. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's it's literally, it's not very, you know, um, I think my first try, like, was I, was, I was just in complete awe. I think I was very silent. I love it. The one criticism I have about that fight is, like, it takes your agency away from you right at the end. Like, it's already taken a lot of it, yeah. your agency out yeah. anyway, right, um, by giving you a f- tank. Sorry, beep. Um... <laughs> But, you know, that's okay, because it's, it's Resident Evil, you know, also Chris gave you this, so it's like, you know, boulder punching Chris, you know, so it's like, that's, this is, it's uh, homage to RE5, but I would have really have liked to just actually do the last hit, yeah. rather than there just being a cutscene that does it, um, instead, like, it, it just, uh, I just felt like that. it took my agency away, it took my choice away, <clears throat> but... In terms of his design, like I, I liked his design. It made sense for who he who he was. Like he he, I would have liked to have seen him turn into it. Like, but I think that's a criticism of the game, to be honest, because we don't see a lot of that transformation stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I liked his design. It made sense for him. He's a you know he's an electromagnetic you know X man. You know he's. <laughs> You know he can he can control fields around him, and he you know and he is building a metal army. He believes, you know, cyborgs are the future. So why not make yourself one giant cyborg crab? You know, because <laughs> crabs are great. Um, yeah, I, I really like the fight. Um, in terms of like other boss fights, uh, the Alcina fight is a strange one. Like I'm doing more speedruns, I've noticed that her timing is really strange. Like, the way she does things. <clears throat> like, I'm pretty sure you only have to hit her once when she first lands. Then you have to let her lunge. You hit her again. Lunge. Hit her again. Lunge. Hit her again. Mm. And then it's when she flies off, that's when you put down the damage. Right? Because I think it's all... Like, all that bit is scripted. Uh, which is kind of kind of sucky. Yeah, um, I think you're probably right. Yeah. And then when you get to the actual tower, it's it's just uh, it's just all scripted. But that design is fantastic. And the lore behind it, like the lore of that dagger of death flowers being full of like kind of poisons, you know, that she was afraid of. Um <clears throat> and she locked it away. Mm. And then her being stabbed by it because she thought it was gonna kill her, but in the end it didn't. She just got very mad and turned into a flying slug, you know, with teeth. Um yeah, I love that. Um, Moreau fight is very Lovecraftian. Adore it. Um, again, like it, and it, it was kind of the most, uh, what's the word? It, it was the most recognizable because of the little story you hear at the beginning um, mm. about the fish king and mm. everything. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. And then there's, and then there's Angie, like, you know, a, a doll with a, some kind of bow inside it like it's 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 it's, it's it was pretty good. i love that boss fight i remember completing it well i say boss fight uh you know it's just hide and seek but 
yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when I when I completed it, I was like, oh, this is so cool because it's so different. You know, mm-hmm. you, not seen anything like this. Um, you know, and then you know, I have the opinion. I have two favorite bosses, and then two for different di- different things. For how bombastic and wild it is, Heisenberg is my favorite fight. But pure beauty and design is the last fight with Miranda. Like, right. it is such a beautiful fight. Like, yeah. and her design is so beautiful. And they they could have easily done the Resident Evil thing, you know, and I think that's a criticism online. People are like, oh, why are you going to use my rocket launcher? It's like, well, they're trying to progress Resident Evil. You know, you could have gone up against a big blobby monster, which, to be fair, you kind of do go up against, but you don't really... Like, Ethan does it for you because mm-hmm. he's a bad, bad bum. Right, but... Yeah, that end fight was just so pretty. I lo- when I seen it, I was in awe. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to kill her because I was like, "You're so pretty, Miranda. I don't want to kill you. Stay, stay here. You know, just you know, I'll stay here with you. I'll, I'll, I'll help you with your door <laughs> finding ways. You know, just, just let me stay here because she reminds me of something from Dungeons and Dragons, right? Um, sure, called the Raven Queen, who is a god. She's kind of a god of death or of judgment, right? I mean, everyone knows my love for Velka from Dark Souls as well. And she's got kind of, I love that kind of aesthetic. And yeah, uh, adore, adore, adore them. Adore her. I wanted, I wanted to hear, see more of her, right? And I hope they keep up with these fantastical designs rather than just re- resulting to big blob shoot many time. Mm. You know, anyway, that's me. <laughs> All right, Adam, you're up next. What do you think of the boss fights? Definitely agree with James on the Lady D boss fight. She, I mean, I have the infinite stake magnum. Mm. And you in the first bit when she's basically, she basically has to destroy all of like the structure around the, the parapet of the castle. Right. Yeah. Cause I put like 40 shots of the stake <laughs> magnum into her and she should be dead from that. Uh, cause it kills everyone else in like one hit or right. a couple hits. <laughs> yeah. So she's just on a timer. Basically you mm-hmm. have to let her smash up the castle. And then once she flies for the first time, that's when you basically can hit her damage boxes. Mm-hmm. So as soon as she's off the castle, you hear her a couple of times with the Magnum and then the cutscene kind of kicks in. So, um, so that's that. I mean, it's, it's a bit of like lifting the curtain, unfortunately, but it's still a, a fun fight. It's a nice little claustrophobic area. Mm. She has a variety of ways of, of coming at you, either like lunging around or flying or, you know, turning and zipping around the other side is, is good. And she keeps up some fun dialogue the whole time. So I enjoyed that a lot. The, the doll fight is very cool. I love the little kadu inside Angie's head. That's, Mm. Like messed up, and the whole lore of Donna sharing her kudu amongst her dolls is creepy as hell. So there's that, um, and I, and again, I like the fact that you you're killing Donna. She's like an invisible force there. So that was fun. Not much of a boss fight, really. It's more of a hide and seek game, but that's mm. that's enjoyable. Moreau was probably the most interesting boss fight in terms of arena yeah and i would agree with that putting up barriers for you and you know spewing down the rain so you have to hide so that was a, a fun fight definitely and then heisenberg is is the low point for me as well so i know that james you said you liked it but i couldn't even understand what he was supposed to look like mm. you know it was it was a weird design it didn't look like anything in particular it did the annoying thing where it's like, shoot my glowing areas because my design is so confused. Whereas the other bosses had such, like, you just knew where to shoot Lady D. It was like, oh, she's sprouting out of the back of the dragon. Shoot that. Like, Mm -hmm. Angie obviously was like, attack that, um, which did automatically. And then Moreau was again like, oh, this is where I instinctively know to shoot. And then with Heisenberg, they don't have that, so they just have to give you that horrible, like, oh, I've seemingly blown off these glowing areas like eight times. And yeah, mm. it just ke- all you do is respawn them, basically. So mm. there's no sense of progression until you just hit the damage count that you're supposed to. 
it, it originally according to the concept art you were supposed to shoot down the electricity pylons to fall onto him and that might have been more interesting but who knows but yeah i didn't really like the moreau fight uh, the sorry the heisenberg fight and then just like james says they take it out of your hands at the end which is weird because halfway through the fight they let you do it so yeah. he holds you above his head and they let you pull the trigger yeah yeah. To sort of spark the next part of the fight. So I don't know why they didn't do that again. Mm. And then the whole reason Chris tells you that Brum is ready, he's <laughs> like, listen, you got to jump on Brum. He's going to take you out there and, and mess up Heisenberg because this is a polymer alloy. So he can't control it with his magnesis. And then you get out there and he's like, I'm going to fly it in the air with the magnesis, <laughs> even though I couldn't do that. And it's the reason that you can use it to fight me. But also, bullets hurt me. Are they polymer bullets? Because why isn't he not just like, oh, he bullets? That's hilarious. Oh, you've got a cannon? Oh, okay. You cannot physically hurt me with those things. Science! <laughs> Steve, like, every time you oh, shoot sorry. him, he should be getting bigger. <laughs> yeah, that's true as well. <laughs> Till he just can't handle it anymore. Steve, what did you think of uh, Heisenberg and company? <laughs> Genuinely, I, I feel like everyone's hit on all the points I want to say, but uh, I, I love the fact they all have their unique dialogue and their character really comes out in these boss fights. That that part is, you know, it, it's uh, it's fun when a boss is chatty. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, especially Lady D, because when she's stalking you, she's kind of a bit meh. Like she she's um. Just a, a posh, angry woman. But when she's a mad, crazy woman, my God, hilarious. Uh, in, in all the right ways. Yeah. Uh, also, maybe it's just my inner Castlevania tendencies, but the fact we're fighting a mutated bat vampire monster on a giant tower streams to me we should have had a whip unlockable weapon rather than a lightsaber, Capcom. Um, <laughs> generally speaking, I, I think my favorite boss fight is Miranda. Because it feels almost like it's called backy in some places. Like mm. I swear, her spider form is straight up Sadler. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Heisenberg. Sadler. Right. I have a very complicated relationship with the live action transform Transformers films. Very much in the same vein that uh, I am with the Resident Evil live action films, isn't it? I think they're kind of crap. So from the the uh, the Shard and Fraud. Oh, no, no, that's that's enjoying someone else's misery. No, they, from, from the ability to blast a Bayformer's creation to bits <laughs> is pretty fun. However, as Sia said, the fight is dog shit. And the fact that, the fact that you, they have to give you a file that pretty much says, Oh, look, Heisenberg made himself a tank that he can't control. It's some deus ex machina level bullshit. Like, I'm sorry for all the swearing. And it, it has to be said, it goes against the law a little bit. That if he can manipulate metal and stuff, all of a sudden he can't now because he's in a monster form when he's still doing it throughout the fight. Mm. I do think... The on foot sequence when you're outside of the murder mobile is kind of tense. If he had, like, shall we say, more powerful moves that would one shot you, mm. or he changed his moveset a bit, but it is literally he has the same moves both times. It's just one time you're in a murder tank and one time you're on your own. I love the one line at the end, though, where it's just your funeral. It's very like, Ethan, you're such a milk toast gentleman, but that was hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Second place, probably Moreau. Third place, uh, Alcina. Fourth place Heisenberg, and then and Angie. I don't really consider a boss fight. Yeah, not really. Right. Um, Urius boss and company. Event. Yeah, uh, you know the, the we're kind of glazing over with the big lads with the giant weapon. Uh, you know the two optional boss fights, and then Urius and his brother, other Urius. <laughs> they all have the exact same move set. Only one's indestructible, except for the back, mm. and that kind of waters it down a bit. Mm. Um, so yeah, in the tier, Miranda is top, which is surprising because normally the final boss is the worst one, at least mm. in my experience. This is true. This is true. Uh, there are outliers, obviously, but um, that in itself is a testament because it's visually stunning. And it's even got some really cool set pieces where she like blacks the entire arena out, which I wish happened more often. Mm. You know, she shapeshifts, she's got like key blasts, and I swear she's got enough moves to be like a Dark Souls from soft boss. Uh, <laughs> <really nice. laughs> And, and for that, I give it the crown in terms of boss fights. I think it was pretty good, despite the fact the arena is a little bit claustrophobic, in it? Yeah, that was my biggest issue with Miranda. It's like, I wish that we had managed to... Because you fight her in, like, the chalice area, but obviously it's all molded over. Mm -hmm. But then it just doesn't look as good, because, like, she'll jump up on the big statues, but you can't really tell what they are. Mm. If they had just kept it 
as that area, the Giants Chalice area, with a little bit of like infection around it, I think it would have looked visually more exciting. My mm. problem with that boss fight is that Chris takes a shot at her to sort of like give Ethan the chance to grab the baby, and then well, I don't know, goes for a walk afterwards, I guess, because he doesn't really do much. I guess he'd like strong arm some ammo down to the ground, perhaps, but he doesn't I, seem to really be helping out. I, in defense of that, um, he needs to get the f out of there. So <laughs> I he, guess, yeah. So like, he get, takes one shot. I mean, he, you, you know, we see him in the plane in the next scene. So like, he needs to get out of there. So I'm got, I'm gonna give it the benefit of the doubt there. No, I didn't even see him. Like, I heard him. Yeah, shoot I don't think and... you see him. I think you just hear him. To be fair. Um, I think so, yeah. that it would be more interesting going back to the Heisenberg fight if you get to take him on as Ethan in Brum and then after after he does like the magnetic slam thing that like takes you out of the vehicle, it would be interesting if we switched to Chris at that point for a bit because then we could like I could understand Heisenberg being killed by like the freaking you know laser pointer. Mm weapon like that that might look really good if you have like chris and his team on like a ridge overlooking it or whatever so you can actually like detonate the factory yourself and then shoot down heisenberg and then you know it's a i just think that might be a better transition so let's talk about characters uh steve said ethan mr milk toast um as he certainly was in seven um, now I suppose perhaps that's up for debate. I'd be interested to hear uh, people's opinions of Ethan. I think that for me at this point, his his personality obviously has developed a lot in this game, and I would put it really on par with sort of the other characters in the series, the other major character in the series. Take that however you like, and whatever I think about the fully developed nature of other characters. Um, but I think he's up there, and obviously it helps that he gets to have two games in a row. Not not every character has can say that. Um, and mostly I just love that his personality is basing, basically he just spends the game telling people much scarier than he is to F off <laughs> his best, the yeah. best line in the game is him I'm not going to repeat it, it was with him and Miranda <laughs> he just points a gun at her and swears at her twice it's, like, it's so good um, and again like that, a lot of that is hope, like, helped with the dialogue and the performance uh, of Ethan's voice actor is is really good and overall the voice acting in the game is really strong um i'm getting over my jeff shiner's carlos and chris issue you can't unhear it though can you unfortunately but he did a really good job um as chris as did everyone um and there's a lot of returning voice actors so for the for the sake of it uh neil newbon um, is fantastic as Heisenberg as as he should be. He was a great Nikolai, and you can kind of hear that in like his laugh and stuff. But it's the same guy. But mostly he did a fantastic job. Some of the other voice actors you can tell who they were immediately. Uh, Sarah Coates, who played Marguerite, is uh, Louisa, who lets you in a home near the beginning of the game. That one's kind of obvious. And um, Nicole Tompkins, who played Jill, shows up a couple times as a couple different characters, and that's pretty clear. Angie is played by Evelyn Rhodes. Uh, sorry, Paula Rhodes, who played Evelyn, and you can you can hear that maybe, but she did a fantastic job. They all did a really good job with these characters. I think the absolute shining star, just because you you would never tell until you looked this up, uh, Jesse Pimentel, who played Lucas Baker, is unrecognizable as Moreau, uh, which is just fantastic. Wow, um, it's an odd choice to bring all these voice actors back immediately, but I can't say that they didn't do a brilliant job. Um, in terms of their performance. And yeah, overall, I think all, I don't have any issues with any of the characters. All the Lords and Ethan are really good. Generally like Chris's portrayal. And of course, the Duke, who's good fun. And I like that he's part of the story as well. Uh, Steve, how do you feel about the characters? I know I said milk toast, but it's more the fact that he's like systems engineer. I actually genuinely think Ethan's gone into the top five. Nice. Me. Like compared to like the... It easily outshines most of the Revelations single shot guest stars. Um... And any of the shooter pro- protagonists, I don't know if he beats like any of the big four out. You know, Leon, Claire, Chris, sure, Jill, but still pretty solid. Um, I think there was not a complaint to be had. I actually, I, I had a weird epiphany. I was talking about this on Twitter that the the fact they brought so many voice actors back from you know RE7 and RE3, it's almost got an anthology feel to it. Mm. Uh, 
likely because of the pandemic, maybe, but all of that, that, you know, yeah, you know what, you're on this soundstage recording this, do you want to do this? Mm. And just, you know, and uh, it's fine. Once you get over the fact that they're playing different characters, which admittedly, I was one of the people when I first heard Chris using Jeff Shine's voice, that's not Chris, that's Carlos, or some other double bluff. No, it, it, it actually is Chris, it's just the same voice actor. And they all put in solid performances throughout. I think um, I was expecting the Duke to backstab me, and the fact that he didn't makes him an absolute <laughs> gent. <you know? laughs> He's your one uh, true ally, you know. Yeah. Uh, Chris, at, at times, I think the only thing when it comes to characters, Chris kind of, I think the intention is to make you mad because he feels like he's just being nothing but a jerk to you until that one epiphany scene. Mm. Um, and like, you know, stay out of our business, et cetera, et cetera, being cryptic and confusing. Um, I think we were all at some point kind of thinking he wasn't actually going to be evil, but we're waiting for the reveal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have not a single complaint about the Lord, save for the fact that Lady D. Maybe, it, maybe I'm just bored of the character arc, character arc type of you know someone who's up the room bomb. I see it all the time at customer service at Tesco. So, um, <laughs> but probably coloring my own experiences here with having to deal with that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, but uh, Angie, fantastic as a demented little like twisted doll, and mm. the, she only gets one line. But Donna unnerves the hell out of me with "Don't leave, I can't let you." Mm. and Moreau. Like, I've never thought I'd feel sympathy for the fish man who pukes in his own bowl, but somehow I do, and yeah, I still blast him. <laughs> uh, Adam, any particular stands out for you in terms of characters? Um, You know, I, I really did like most every portrayal. Everybody did a great job, but there's one thing that really, really bothered me, and that was, like nothing pulled me out of my immersion quicker than everyone being american right sure it was a when when i played resident evil 4 luis had a spanish accent the villagers had spanish accents all of mm-hmm. the characters had some sort of accent and in this you go English. into the house and everyone was american like it pulled me out like the the dude that was like we should kick everybody out like, and all of those characters, all of those villagers had such American nuances to what they said mm. and and the way they spoke, which completely was not the look of the village. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, it was to the point where at first I was like, oh, I thought this was a European village. And I thought maybe I had confused it and that it was in like the mountains, like some weird mountain village in America somewhere. Because literally every person had an American accent and would speak with American, like, colloquialism. Mm. It it's, was very disappointing in that sense. It's really hard that, to disagree with that, to be honest. That would have definitely yeah. added some extra shine. I think right. I think that it's the nuances is, is the big thing, right? Like, it's okay to, to have those accents. It's okay to speak like that, but it's the nuances... That really, yeah, that, it's the I, way everybody felt like they were speaking, like as Americans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't yeah, well. feel like they had their own culture, and they should have had that in this game. You know, it's kind of a thing. Like, yeah, you don't want to say where it is. Like when Resident Evil Four came out, they never said it was Spain. Like, mm-hmm. not for the longest time, they were like they still a European don't, don't place, think. right? And they still don't specifically say Spain. Mm. Whereas, like, it's like this. It's like, if you want to do a European village, like, the only reason for it to be in Europe is to... There's no reason for it to be in Europe. Mm -hmm. Really, if you think about it, there's no reason it has to be in Europe. It's just that's where they decided to do it. And then just to kind of not lean into that and get some very talented actors that can do, like, a good, like... Slavic or whatever, like kind of like accent is just a really missed, missed mark for me, uh, and, and it bothers me. And I also really miss Ada Wong being in it. <laughs> she was she was supposed to be in it. So uh, there's art. There's really cool artwork of her that I posted in the live chat, where she has like a a crow like gas mask and a crossbow. And I could have just imagined her doing a bunch of really cool stuff in this game. Ada yeah. without Leon is an appealing prospect, plus, you know, separate ways. Uh, right. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I mean, had the we, same first right? thought, especially like it'd be, it would have been nice to see her without Leon, nonetheless. We we uh, we might get DLC, you know. I mean, we'll mm -hmm. talk about a bit by that later, but like it's kind of very separate ways ish, where it kind of fills in right. some gaps. I'm. I mean, we're definitely going to get some DLC. I feel. Um, I'm very interested to see where they go with it because it's. Is it going to be from the sort of viewpoint of Rose? All right. Are we going to like jump that far? Or are we going to get something to do with Chris, well, like infiltrating or what? What I will say is, and I don't necessarily, we don't like, you know, there's still stuff to talk about before we even start tearing into DLC. But what's quite interesting <laughs> to me is that the shots in trailers that of the villagers and stuff that were cut from the game. And, I, and we'll get to it, but I think stuff definitely got cut. It'd be interesting to see if it gets repurposed. There's lots of oh. shots of, you know, Elena and her father and stuff that never never turned up. Um, I want to shout out one other character that I, did. I didn't actually think I'd feel much for, but I genuinely, like those ending scenes, the stuff with Mia, um, mm. and especially in the helicopter when she is hella angry for reasons. Mm. Like, man, I was feeling it. Like, that was a fantastic performance, um, this, this, especially the ending for this. Like, I love all the characters, how they play out at the end. Yeah, I, you know, um, we are definitely dipping into spoiler territory now, especially with what I'm going to say. So, uh, nonetheless, I think a lot of people got an emotion about the ending, and that's great. Um, the one bit that got it for me was Jeff Shine saying, he's gone. Uh, that line, I think, was the, the emotional twig for me, where I actually, yeah, I felt a little bit more something there. Um, yeah, the, end, the end's very good like that. And I agree about Mia. Uh, James, what do you, what's your take on the roster of characters in this game? So I'll try and be as concise as possible. Um, so this would be, well, this is one of my favorite things to talk about other than the story and the ending. But yeah, as I say, I'll need to kind of hang back a bit because of word vomiting. But um, <laughs> so yeah, every character in this game stood out for me. Uh, from Lady D, the daughters, Moreau, and then my favorite character in the game, Donna Beneventio, Beneviento, um, who barely had a word to say, but with the little words she had, they like told a thousand you know mm. um but yeah i really felt like every character had so much history in this place they were connected to it completely which again we'll talk about in the story section and then there's our hero ethan who <laughs> miraculously went from mediocre no face man to someone we all cried over because of how sad his story was absolute um, which, dad uh, yeah <laughs> Which is like a feat in itself for me, you know. The voice acting, motion capture, voice direction, direction, like of these characters was all sublime. Like, and it was those things and locations, which is why we spent so much time on those. That that that's all the reason why I was hooked from this game and still and still play it even the over the dozen times I've played it. I'll keep doing it because I'm completely hooked. On this you game. know a character nobody's mentioned because of her complete uselessness? The hag. Miranda as the hag. <laughs> just, just pointless. Like, didn't didn't need to be there. Like, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Could have used some other kind of throw, exposition um, device. I don't mean to throw shade at Miranda, but I believe she may or may not have been insane from the get-go. Um, please don't haunt me, Crow Lady, with your completely <laughs> bad plan that I still can't fully comprehend the inner workings of. No, don't haunt Steve. Haunt me instead. <laughs> <laughs> and now, reading the file, the Seal's Final Testament from Resident Evil Village, Dwayne Maluski, who you can follow on Twitter, at MaluskiVO. The wounds are severe. I won't last much longer. I can hear it shuffling about outside. It barely flinched when I shot it. I feel like it's toying with me. That isn't a wolf. Still, I won't lie down like a dog. If I can get to the old water mill, I can stop it. I can protect you. It's so close. Damn. I'm so cold. My legs won't work. I'm sorry, Louise. Please forgive me. 
Well, let's get to that then. It's time to talk about the story of the game. Um, we won't get so far as the ending, but sort of the general premise and how things play out through the majority of the game. Um, which obviously, we kind of knew going in, it was about uh, Ethan and Mia's child, Rosemary, who'd been taken. Um, the murder or seeming murder of Mia uh, and Ethan finding himself in this village and the sort of the lords of the village and how and and from there you know everything was a bit of a mystery um there isn't a whole lot more in terms of the actual story a lot of it's more in sort of files and notes and, and background law which is very appreciated that's the way i like to do things because it gives you that option of how much you do and don't want to read into it and, and that kind of thing mm. gotta love a file um i thought the pacing of the story was pretty solid overall really um capcom is good at trimming the facts i guess uh, and i just said about stuff that we didn't see that was in trailers but i think they did it for the right reasons i do think it has some plot holes in in the story because of it and even if it's just minor stuff like elena says to ethan i hope you find your family and he's never mentioned them once that's clearly because of a cut scene uh, scene that got cut there's a few more bits like that, that i'm sure we mentioned but in terms of the the setup you know Going from the village into the castle, out with this mysterious object, and the Duke then explaining that you need to find the four pieces of the Golden Rose Force uh, to, to bring them back to the middle of Hyrule and stop Figo the Carpathian, I thought was was uh, <laughs> was pretty good. Um, I was I was happy with it, 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 but it's it's probably the places where I can pick the most holes. I, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that's like, well, you didn't quite answer that. There's a couple of things like that that are a problem. What I did like was um, how the the lead up to the end, the reveals kind of played out on screen via files, an, an optional room with these roots that made you go, okay, things are getting serious. But more than that, the moment for me that I really loved the most was after killing my first few enemies and watching them crumble to sort of like grey and black dust, like turning into rocks almost, very much in the same way that Evelyn dies at the end of RE7, that's when I got immediately excited because I knew that this was going to be a full-on sequel and we were going to get a lot more information on sort of the background of RE7 and the mould and stuff like that. And again, that's environmental storytelling in its own way. And then, yeah, from there, you get the, the slow build of stuff like the Kadu and then the Root, stuff like that. So, so overall, pretty happy. But, yeah, I'll, I'll pick some holes when we get to that point, definitely. Um, but I loved it as a sequel. I think it works really, really well. And I was very satisfied with the, the two-game Ethan arc. Um, Adam, how do you feel about the story? How spoiler-tastic can I get? <laughs> I mean, let's not talk about the ending cutscenes, at least. Save that till after. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, it's so difficult without it, though. It's so difficult for me to sum what I feel. I mean, all right. Do you know game. what? Let's just rip the lid off and go. Go for it. Okay, good. <laughs> right. So, like the the part that blew me away was Ethan being killed by Jack. Right. Like the fact that, like, when he stomps you out in that room, that's him like breaking your skull and killing you. And then from that moment on, Ethan is dead. Mm-hmm. And it's the reason why Ethan, in this game, unbeknownst to him, goes through everything so stoically. Mm-hmm. Like, he's he's not scared of anything. And the reason he's not scared is he's dead. He just doesn't know it. So he's reacting in, like, a fearful way. He's making the noises... But, like, the whole way through, he's not really that bothered because there's something inside of him or not inside of him that is allowing him to to act in the way he acts. And it's so well foreshadowed. I love that when Lady D, like, cuts you and drinks your blood and she's like, oh, he's a bit stale. Mm. And you just think, oh, she's being a dick. But no, you're dead. Your blood is, like, turning to stale. Like, you're full of mold. And it's... I just love that whole arc. I love yeah. the fact that like it put so much in perspective for me about how Ethan was, how he reacts to stuff. It answered the obvious questions as to how Ethan can take so much punishment. 
like we always knew it was going to be something weird to do with the mold but the fact that like he's basically and all those people were complaining about resident evil 7 not having zombies in they didn't know they were playing one the whole time <laughs> so like screw you like capcom got you there uh, it's just i i i loved it i loved the arc i loved that how contained it was i wasn't as I wasn't as much of a fan as them linking it to Umbrella in the way they did because it just seemed a little lazy. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, it seven and eight feel so contained. Um, it was nice to do that, but really, that's all you could give us. Mm-hmm. Like as your link is like, oh, I liked this image that we saw on a wall somewhere, so uh, that's what we're gonna use. Like, okay, great, big yeah. whoop. It, it, but yeah. I was I was engrossed with it the whole way. I I liked the the whole Mia thing. I really enjoyed that Chris battled to be like, what? How much do I tell Ethan? And then like his team tells him off about it. <laughs> and even though they only have a few lines, his team they all like the one where he was like, "Yo, you should have told Ethan." He's like, "Yeah, I know." And he's like, "No, you should have told him." Like that was a great telling off mm. of, of that of I love being that like, line. "Hey, yeah, that line where he was basically like, we knew Mia wasn't Mia, and we didn't do anything. We didn't tell Ethan. Mm-hmm. Like we just went in and basically acted like complete assholes to to Ethan, essentially, just because we didn't want him getting involved. So it's There's, interesting, um... and I and I think the end saying the father's story is now done is obviously we're going to get something to do with the kid. Right. Well, we'll circle back around to that, definitely. Um, so, I, I I loved it. I really loved the game, and I loved the, the whole re- revelation of Ethan and, and the way it kind of made me even look back into Seven and being like, oh, yeah, that's why he could do those things. Mm-hmm. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely talk about my reaction to some of that stuff. We'll, we'll circle back around to me. But I do want to point out just another a great little thing that nobody really noticed. And why would you? Um, when you get your arm sliced off, uh, you pick it back up. Uh, you, know, you Generally, you're just going to put it straight back in your inventory and run around in a mad panic because you're down there with Lady D and, and you want to get out. If you spin that piece of arm around, you can see mold inside of uh, Ethan's severed hand. Which pretty much oh, nice. gives, which is just a great thing where it's like planted in there and you don't notice because you're That's not going to look. That's such a great little scene the way it like the screen just kind oh, of flashes. Oh yeah, flash it's, it. it's fantastic. And and then, then, the only thing that really bothers me is like Ethan's sleeve and shirt sleeve should fall off, not reattach. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're not attached fair. to his arm. But that that scene where he reattaches his hand, I was kind of like. Uh, okay, are they going to explain this? Because for a lot of the game, I was kind of waiting for his fingers to like regrow on his left hand. It was like, is that was there going to be right. a moment when they when he regrows and that or whatever? Because clearly, by the time when he sealed his hand back onto his arm, I was like, okay. Well, he can maybe gonna... reattach limbs, but not regrow, them. right? Because those things Cause... got eaten. Yes, hundred percent. That's the case, isn't it? Because with seven, it's the same thing. You can get his leg chopped off and put back on. Um, but they never say anything about regrowing stuff in the same way that Jack did. So that was kind of like an interesting flag of what was to come, I thought. Uh, Steve, how do you feel about the story overall? Still trying to piece together some of it. Like, yeah, yeah. Miranda's plan still confuses the heck out of me, but I generally had a great time. Uh, like I said, I was expecting Duke, because obviously they know quite a lot about what's going on. I was expecting some kind of, like, you know, next-level betrayal at the end, but he's just a solid guy trying to help you out, apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, either that or he's some kind of mental symptom of the mold or something. At one point, I was discussing, maybe it's the will of the Mega Mice made flesh. That still sounds insane, Stephen. Um, <laughs> didn't appreciate the fact that it's uh, very much beat-for-beat, beat, like, here's another law room at the end. Yeah, that's I, fair. I, 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 I prefer it when it's a bit more scattered throughout the game, but that's just that's just the way it rolled. They revealed that Miranda was Mia. I kind of had an inkling. I mean, we all knew that Mia can't take you know, could take seven or eight shots to the head, and she's fine. I mean, look at RE7. Uh, <laughs> so that was a bit of a uh, red flag. The, the, the I think the big takeaway for me was that yes, it explains a lot. That's why he's been so crazy the entire time. Uh, and that that's he's been dead, and I, I feel like his uh, his dedication to his family, like this is personal head kind of nonsense. So by all means, take it as it is. But I feel like his dedication to his family is some kind of after effect of being infected by Evelyn, who was obsessed with family, which is why he's so damn dedicated to getting mm-hmm. his kid back. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
the the reactions he had throughout the story, I think, were very much in sync with me. I know that's the point, but literally when uh, Duke says, "Yeah, we can fix this," you know, what from this? Like literally, the, pretty much in the same mental boat. Same when leaving the uh, Benevieta house. So a, a good uh, measure of where the player's mindset is at, mm-hmm. uh, I think, in terms of Ethan's script writing, I, I, uh, I genuinely enjoyed that the characterization of that. Still have no merry idea. What's the point of sending Ethan on this fool's errand to reassemble his daughter right. when she could have killed the lords herself. Apparently, from what I understand is, by Ethan killing these lords, that has in some way triggered the Mega My seat in some fashion. But surely it was already active anyway, because like, she says it herself that you've awakened the Mega My seat and no longer are needed, and then she, you know, rips his heart out. Um, okay, yeah. I wasn't aware of that line necessarily. That's not one that I caught, but there's... So there's a lot of like things where it's like, cool, you glaze over that with one line and didn't really give me enough detail in in terms of that because that's some of my issue as well. Certainly, I'm still, like yeah, what, I'm what trying to piece together her general plan. Um, yeah, her plan was just Nick Rose, break Rose, reassemble Rose, profit, and uh, even then, I think this is there is clearly some more stuff going on we don't understand because she does everything according to plan for herself, and it backfires. Yeah, and they don't really explain why that happened, necessarily. Um, I mean, that's Rose MVP, apparently. Although... I, I guess. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to move too I far into the ending that, right, right away, but... Mm. So I think the Evelyn was, like, the uber mold, like, controller-type person, right? She was super... Um, conductive with controlling the mold and Evelyn essentially infects both Mia and Ethan with this say alpha mold so I think when they had a baby that that was like the next step in like like the mold being like a thing I imagine so that's, that's why like that whole family is needed to to kind of make the the mega my seat kind of react mm-hmm. by having having it there in in its presence. I imagine that's kind of the explanation that we're probably going to get is that because it's like been passed down and sort of gestated in a different way that the mega yeah. my seat can't necessarily deal with it because perhaps it's had too much DNA tampering. But they don't, they don't exactly. That, it's but not the same. The, right. The, uh, as the game well, if you look at the Mega My Seat, it's a big. It's in the shape of a fetus. I mean, right. the game has made it so the Mega My Seat or the Muta My Seat, whichever, it apparently is a jack of all trades omni gel that will do whatever the plot requires. Mm. Uh, be it like, you know, vampirism or, you know, well, mind control. The vampirism Ele- thing, well, that I was think. The Kadoo, though, as well. Electric rays. <laughs> I think the vampirism thing is actually quite clever because the file right at the end tells you she's not a vampire at all. She's just got some terrible blood deficiency and she needs to drink blood right. to stay healthy. Exactly. So she's not a vampire. Mm. She's just a mental person who drinks blood. That's, yeah, she's not um, a vampire. She's just, just a werewolf, werewolves, <laughs> yeah. which is nice. Which I, I really like, I like um, that. I did like the reverse reveal that the uh, the daughters, this is a, a complete side tangent, I apologise, but the fact the daughters were more or less Bugs first the eight mm. corpses. So they're basically the yes. leech men all over again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Only this time, less pan flutes, more sickles. Um, <laughs> so there's a couple of things, Steve, that I just wanted to touch on that you said. One, I totally agree. And I do love the fact that sort of uh, what you're saying about the, the family driving part of all these characters. Um, it also kind of explains in a reverse fashion why Evelyn is is obsessed with having a family is because it it is probably to do with Miranda's own tinkering and trying to make her own daughter. That's probably why she's family obsessed as well. But in terms of one lines that tell you things, but don't really tell you things in, in terms of Miranda's plot, Heisenberg says at one point that basically the whole thing's a test basically. And he's like, you know, trying to see if you're strong enough to join her family Maybe that's why she does the splitting up to see if you're the real deal, but it doesn't really go anywhere. And can you really trust Heisenberg at that point? So I don't really know. I think either. she does. She does yeah. the splitting up, I think, to make sure that the baby is a good enough host for her child. 
I think Mrs. she's o- test she's testing the ability the Rose's ability to reform. But couldn't she just do that herself? <laughs> like why did she well, have yeah, to go and take them away the for a week? Well I know, but like you need like an explanation for these things. We <laughs> have to think about it in like you know, Occam's razor this a little bit. Okay. That Miranda is mental. Like, you know, they, they are <laughs> She's they are so mentioned. crazy. Oswald E. Spencer thinks, nah, mate, I'll do it my own way. Ta bye. <laughs> Never interacts with her again. Yeah. I well, agree. She's just I... too obsessed with the her one goal. With her goal. I think. Mm, yeah. Maybe. And he's more like, I want to change everything. Yeah. I uh I agree though, Adam, with what you said about the umbrella ties. It was a little bit tenuous. I don't yeah. mind it. I don't it have a problem a with it. To be like, I mean, it's just a case of like they made it's it feel a like MacGuffin. it's a MacGuffin. It's, it is what it is. It is so they could put the logo in all the trailers and, and all that because it's the Resident Evil logo. Right. Uh, right. It doesn't... drew a lot of us in to begin with, it, I think, yeah. and there was a slightly lackluster payoff, if I'm yeah. honest. Very I'll lackluster. I'll take it because the game was still fun. But yeah. um, the chat has uh, said, uh, mentioning about how the Mutant My Seat contains memories. I think this is a great thing that we're going to find more about later. Um, well, it it doesn't just contain. It does. It contains memories. It contains genetic sequences. Um, in the concept art, it tells you that Miranda's different forms are all sequences from within the metamycete. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, like the spider was a thing. The the flying thing was its own thing. Like they're all being summoned out of it through her, basically, and that's why. She wanted Rose because I think that maybe when she found the mutamycete, maybe something, her daughter who died of Spanish flu maybe was consumed by the mold after. And that's why she wants Rose because it's like she can pull Eva, Eva out of the mutamycete and into this mold baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, James has been very, very quiet this entire time, and I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate him patiently waiting because I know he's about to blow up. So it's because gonna... if I add anything, I think it will go on and spiral like even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, right. So there's this theory of mine, and it's just bu- pu- purely due to the character designs we keep seeing. Th- loud car outside. Uh, we keep seeing. Um, and that is the purpose side of it. Single-minded purpose. Like, I do not believe Miranda at one... Like, at one point, she was a human, right? She had goals, right? And what we're talking about here, like, what's kind of confusing everybody is that we're thinking of her like she is a human being that has goals like we do. Complex goals, right? Except she gets to this point, like, after she's been... Uh, exposed to the Megamycete for so long, where she loses that, like Ethan did, like the Bakers did. You know, the Bakers are all about family. Um, Miranda was all about bringing her daughter back that she lost. Ethan is about bringing his daughter, like finding his daughter, right? It's why he's so stoic in this one, right? And he's so he can take that all that beating, right? Because that's all he knows. The Megamycete has absorbed him, right, and Miranda, and, like, or rather, the opposite way around, right, and they've taken everything of their humanity, right, but they've made them into their most prevalent purpose, right, why they've been put here. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, that's, like, I, I, oh, man, I got, like, a lot here, but um, I, d- I don't want to go too into it, because there's a lot here, but so yeah, I think we all know that Resident Evil Village has um, like it's a story told in two parts, right? Like I think at the end we're going to talk about like which one do we prefer more. And with mm-hmm. me, I don't prefer either because they're both the this like this uh, one arc for me, mm-hmm. you know, um, which is precisely what Capcom wanted. Um, yeah, but every question that arose about Ethan, why he could take such a batter in, why he could re- reattach his hand with apple juice, why some people in the game even feared him, because that's what how I feel with Miranda. When you put your when you put parts of Rose into the Giant's Chalice, and you see that PowerPoint <laughs> slide <laughs> of of her, she's not looking at Rose, who has her arms outstretched. She's looking over at Ethan because he's more important at that point. Like, I mean, Rose is important, 
but Ethan at that point is more important. And she's like, mm, what can I do with him? How can he, how can he help me? How can he fix this? How can he bring my daughter back? Because that's all she's thinking all the time. And this well, like, not only that, J- James, that's a really good point because not only that, but like the point that when you get to the village, the lichens are all attacking the villagers and everything is kind of going crazy where it hasn't been like that before. And everyone's saying, why is mother Miranda abandoned mm. us? Everything she did was to find her child. The reason she made the Lords was to try and find a vessel for her child. So when she finds Rose, she's like, okay, I don't need the Lords anymore. I'm done with you guys. I'm done with yeah. the village. I won't, I don't need the Lycans to not attack it anymore because I found what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. So that's why it all kicks off. Yeah, exactly. And like that's her purpose, right? She's found it. Um, but yeah, like, uh, I think that like... To, to, to go back to story, like, this story, this story of this game is very melancholy, which I adore. <laughs> I love my heart being ripped into pieces and then brought back together again, like we see at the end. Uh, it makes us feel human. And that's sad because Ethan isn't. Our hero isn't human at all. And that's so sad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then we have, <laughs> on top of that, Then we have the heartbreaking story of a mother losing her child during a plague that killed 5% of the entire world's population in the early 20th century. Like, she was brought to a level of giving up completely, like a feral animal and dying in a cave before she was gifted the Megamycete. And then went on to try and bring her door back, but constantly failing. That is enough to drive anybody mad, even if you haven't been infected by the Megamycete. And that isn't to say, like, she's good, because she isn't. She killed hundreds hundreds of people. Right, living that long as well, the amount of people (laughs) she is. Yeah. It's like, she killed hundreds of people with the intent of bringing her daughter back. But it's still, like, that's still really heart-rending. And the reason why I love this story is, like, I don't want to be too critical of previous games, Right, but I never felt like it. I could humanize with a lot of characters in Resident Evil, but in Resident Evil Village, I can do. Mm-hmm. I can connect to each one of these characters because they've done so well in filling their backstory and their history. I mean, they've done so well that we've spent forty-five minutes talking about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I love that, and it's something they can build on. Uh, but yeah, this all <laughs> this all blew apart because of a mother's love for her child and oh man <laughs> i think uh, i mean i know steve did i did as well i like when i learned that news like chris's reaction and the fact this was mainly his fault for what happened when i learned about miranda too i just oh man it broke me into pieces <laughs> it was so sad mm-hmm. yeah there's yeah. a there's definitely those elements in this game and i i think that's almost like a springboard of what is probably the most effective scene of RE7, which is the sort of moment where you see Jack as a normal man and he sort of tells Ethan that they've got no control and stuff. This really does feel like they took that and, and ran with it a little bit, which is really cool. Um, in the later part of this game, I really... <laughs> I went on a journey, definitely. Um, when Ethan had his heart ripped out of him, I'll admit that that, like, especially straight after the Heisenberg fight, which, you know, my opinion on that, everybody knows now, but I was just deflated after that. I was like, oh, really? Well, that's a bit of a crap way to go. It was out of nowhere. It's very sudden. I knew he was going to die. It was, it was, I had a feeling it was going to go that way. But I was like, oh, you don't even get to take down Miranda. And now we're going to switch to Chris. Sure. Uh, and, and do it for you. That's a shame. And then immediately after that, you get this mission with Chris where all the lichens seem like, you know, plywood. You're just battering through them and they just don't seem like much threat. And I was like, oh no, am I really going to hate the last part of this game? But then we got to the big twist. We got to Ethan standing back up. We got to the, the conversation with Evelyn. Uh, I really loved the the way it twists back around. It almost had me for a moment. I was like, oh, this is really going to turn out bad. But yeah, I really love what they did with Ethan's character. I don't want them to bring him back personally because I, you know, sacrifice means a whole lot more when you actually sacrifice yourself. Um, yeah, I would. I prefer that he doesn't wander back in, but it seems certainly possible that that's going to happen. 
um, with the BSAA sort of thing they've left hanging there and some more law which they put behind a paywall of £10 for some reason. The trauma pack gives you a little more reasoning of what the hell the BSAA are up to, namely they're the reason that Evelyn got transferred to America with a botched job that they did. Um, so that's why they're they show up at the end trying to basically cover up their own mess. And for one thing, that's why um, Ethan and Mia get transferred to Romania. is basically to draw out Miranda so that they can dispose of this entire Mega My Seat thing. That's what I got from it. Um, so that's a cool thread to follow. Uh, and also you've got the epilogue with Rose, which I don't know how I feel about that one, to be honest. Um, because we don't know when it takes place, right? Like, that's the whole discussion. And we're going to... We can't... <laughs> Is there any point in having that conversation too deeply right now? Because we don't know enough about it and we're going to be talking about it for years, I'm sure. Like, yeah. they intentionally left it so vague. It could be 15 years. It could be 20 years. It could be five years. It could be one year, for all we know. With the fact that she's got mold in her, she could be aging incredibly fast. We just don't know. Uh, they, they've given themselves a hook. Exactly. Like, but the yeah, thing I is, know. about that hook, is they've done that several times already with the last few games, like Revelations, all both of them in with cliffhangers. I'd rather see those resolved than this. Mm. And I know this might be a controversial take. <laughs> Maybe. Rosemary's cool. I love her design. I think she's a cool character. I think there's great potential there. But why are we doing this when we got all these other characters that you <laughs> need to do something with? And I'm not talking necessarily about mid-40s Jill or anything like that. That would be nice, of course, but... I'm talking about like Sherry Birkin for God's sake, you know. <laughs> you got characters like that and Jake and all this, and it's like oh, we're just introducing yet more new people. And she's cool. I've got no problem. I'm just like I'm slightly worried now that even more stuff just sort of gets swept aside. I really love this as a pair of games, as a complete arc. It's a brilliant. And how nice is it? We've been talking about it for so long. How nice is it to get an actual sequel? that follows up events from a previous game and answers questions instead of it being a standalone experience. And I do think this is sort of the end of the mold thing, personally, for the most part. I think it's just kind of be like the impact of Rose's quote-unquote powers, if she has any. But it's uh, so nice to get a sequel. Are we, are, we, are we going into ending future? or? Yeah, let's talk about the, 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 the dead end of the game, where you think it goes. Yeah, because um, <laughs> you, you, you reminded me there. It's like when you're exploring that lab and you're doing everything and like you get like you realize just how far back like cause you say like this could this could be the end of the mold, you know, but I have the opposite opinion. <laughs> I think that when you see all that law stuff um, and how far back and what the potential of it. Mm -hmm. The potential legacy you can give Resident Evil Biohazard, like it's complete, it's it's primordial in scope. Like it's it's timeless. It's not like it's not like Assassin's Creed. You know, I'm not talking about that kind of nonsense here. But um, but it's like a gateway has been opened by this game to go much further back than we anticipated. Um, and this also might be a controversial opinion, but. Uh, <laughs> After Resident Evil 5, things have been pretty rocky in terms of canon. Mm -hmm. In terms of origins, um, because it was the end of a 13-year arc, um, a lot of folks might be thinking, <sighs> might have been thinking, like, where do we progress from here? Um, but Capcom, <laughs> Capcom have done the opposite here. They've they've built on those rocky rock those rocky origins mm -hmm. this is why i like it so much and they've set in place and solidified them while also allowing for like many different unique storylines to build up and i hope they take advantage of their of that like many scientists like throughout the games that work on the virus like the many different <laughs> types they always mention there's something missing or that you know and this game and, and this game it gave us that link mm -hmm. It gave us that and got us closer to it, um, but yeah, with that, like I, I, the future of Resident Evil is freaking. It's timeless. It's endless. It's bright. It's full of opportunity, um, and I'm so excited what Capcom have in store for us with this game and but, the, with the future. Do you know like, it, one thing I would totally agree with? What I do love about the mold is that it's just like a like a natural thing, and the Kadoo is sort of building on that as well. I really like that because. 
I guess with some of the canon up to before seven, it was getting progressively more like you know where where does this end? We're putting viruses on top mm. of viruses, and so this is quite an interesting little reset in the same way that the pliers were. So I'd agree with that. Like it. I wouldn't be opposed to them following it on, but I don't know now that you've destroyed sort of like the big, the big bad of it, big boss of it. I don't know. Uh, who who knows? Adam, how do you feel about the sort of cliffhangers of the epilogue? I'm I'm very excited about it to be honest. Um, I think that there's a, there's a few things that worry me. Um, the first thing that worries me is. Capcom was sort of waning with Resident Evil when it came to like six. It wasn't well received. They were made well aware that people didn't really like the game. Um, and then seven and eight have have really like and and the kind of remakes that have leaned into the Resident Evil engine as well. Um, I feel like maybe that they they've told Capcom like, hey, like this is the direction now. You know, this is the new way mm. to go. Like, the old characters are their own thing. We've introduced new characters. People seem to like them. People have really taken well to these games. I can't imagine Chris being a main character in a game again after his section in this game, because how would it play? You can't take Chris back into a scary situation. Mm. Because if you play this game, you know that Chris is now just a gung-ho, I will take on an army of monsters mm -hmm. without breaking a sweat. So he's, in my opinion, he's done for. Like, he'll be like the the father figure over the Resident Evil quote-unquote umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's definitely odd. I would like to see more from Rose going on. I would like this to be its own trilogy, potentially. Um, or even if it's just a DLC... Um, it's, it's a case where we, he, I feel like we might see Ethan again. And the reason I think that is because if creatures that are infected with mold become part of the quote unquote hive mind, the, the, you know, they become part of the mold, then Ethan is essentially inside. Mm hmm rose mm -hmm. he's still there which is why i think she goes to his grave and she's like i love you dad because let's be entirely honest if you were a baby when your father died no matter how much people talk to him up you would never be like yeah All you right. would never have that emotional bond because you would never have known him mm -hmm. but the fact that they're both like she obviously has that bond with him because mm -hmm. he's, like, part of her, literally. Like, I know we all say, oh, we're part of our parents, or, you know, like... We... But he literally is part Rose, yes. part Ethan. It's, it's uh, The conversation, as well, sort of almost feels like, yeah, you get that impression that she talks to him. And exactly. it, might as, it might as well be said, as well. Most people are probably aware of this by now. But uh, if you use a PC mod to unhook the camera at the end of the epilogue, Ethan is walking out there in the road towards the car. So, right. make of that what you will. And I think that might just be a nod. Like, again, they don't expect us to have known that. But yeah. maybe that's to her. Maybe he's still around just It could her. be a, yes, exactly. Right. It could be a vision or um, something. I, and I think that the next, just like um, Jay Muzu just put in the, uh, the comments, I think that we might be going for the third installment to do with the BSAA and Rose, mm -hmm. maybe, and, and see sort of what goes from there because they're turning into the Umbrella, I guess, with their weird like zombie soldier at the end and mm -hmm. stuff. So, Steve, how do you feel about the uh, the epilogue, the sort of the twists and the turns and the uh, the cliffhangers and all of that that's left hanging? This uh, this broke me a little. Uh, in, a, in a good way, in a good way. Like um, when you break it down and think about it, this, all this whole tragedy uh, happens because Chris has basically didn't shoot Miranda just enough times in the intro, really, when you think about it. Um, <laughs> but the, the hardships you go through, and I'll tell you what, those last few steps and when Ethan says uh, goodbye, Rosemary, and he thinks he's walking to his death 
I uh, I was like coming to swelling up in tears a little bit actually. The the uh, Todd Solis performance mm-hmm. A plus really. Yeah. Um I actually don't think he's dead as much as that Capcom want to say he's dead and hammer that point home because we don't see it. We see him click a button and then it cuts away and mm-hmm. that's like that screen magic one oh one isn't it? You don't see a body fall. Um, this is true. As for as for him like walking up at the end, I do feel like that's probably asset reuse or something. I don't I don't feel one to one. Even if it is like, I don't even think Miranda could potentially be done. Like, it could be a simple case of she's using a Ethan skin suit now. I, I'm not hmm. I'm not sure. Hmm. The um the BSAA plot line I feel like is something that needs to be said. It's definitely a shake up we needed. They've always been quote unquote the good guys, but they basically show up and get hammered and everything experience. So. It, it, it stands to reason they want to step up and build a new hmm. aspect to them. Makes them a lot more interesting. Also gives a good, compelling reason for Chris being rogue. Yes. Um, Rose at the end. I don't know. Maybe it's just the fact that I'm a dad. All right. And I always worry about, you know, especially with the pandemic and stuff like that. But I always worry if I would ever leave my loved ones. And uh, uh, that bit, like, if I was breaking when Ethan said goodbye, Rosemary, that about shattered me. Like, hmm. I... Uh, I actually feel like I don't want anything bad to happen to him because they've already been through so much. And it's a fictional video game character. I know that's ridiculous, right? Um, but Village hit me in the gut in its ending. Um, I look forward to seeing where it goes. But there's too many too many uh, threads Unknowns. to pull on right now. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I actually, for a for, uh, uh, random side note, I know we haven't really touched on it, but Chris, like, hammering through them, uh, and a full-on like Call of Duty sequence, which feels like it's its own mini game. If that's all Chris ever does, like he shows up and he's like, you know, the <laughs> uh, the battering ram, that's fine by yeah. me. Yeah, um, I, uh, I. It's funny because we basically had that in two games in a row, and I'm I'm happy if we just do it again. Yeah, like, I don't mind too much. Yeah, like uh, I thought they were, that whole bit with his his cool squad should have been maybe old friends of ours under an alias rather than an entire new bunch of characters. Like, mm-hmm. I would have been fine if Tundra actually was Jill and we had Sheva and maybe Josh or the BSAA irregulars that have opted out. Um, What's saying that Tundra isn't Sheva? Uh, well, her character model is uh, not. Yeah, uh, that, <laughs> that's, that's, not? Something, that's something you'll discover in the concept art when you ah, go through okay. that. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, um, I, I agree with that. As for the uh, the Baker Report stuff, uh, you touched on it. I, I agree. I think law behind a price tag is a bit of a sketchy thing. We've had it with like airsoft guns and toys and stuff like that in the past. Uh, so it's not technically anything new. Just now mm-hmm. it's in a video game. It's still a bit... Yeah. It's, still, it's, I... not, it's not great either, either way. I, I love the content in it. I just kind of wish it wasn't behind a price tag. I um, think that's one of the things where some of that Baker Report stuff um, I think is actually documents that came with airsoft guns and stuff folded back into the game, which is nice. Um, I think mm. you'll get this information from Baker Report show up in a few places in whatever comes next, where the story goes, if it's a if it's nine or a spin off or DLC. I think you'll probably get that information reiterated uh, for every player that can see it because it's it's yeah it's going to be kind of like an important linchpin of that entire story. Yeah, I agree. I, that I, the BSA thing is kind of cool. Um, and different, and it makes sense with their involvement of Blue Umbrella in the past. Uh, perhaps See, they've the won thing. them over. That's the thing. Chris is going against BSAA, but he'll happily still use uh, Blue Umbrella medical equipment and stuff. It's the best I mean, he's maybe got. It, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a needs must situation, mm. or it would be an even more interesting juxtaposition if, like, it turns out Umbrella Core is just completely scrapped from any potential cannon, and they are actually on the level. Uh, you know, wild. if. if if Blue Umbrella are that awesome, the good guys and the BSA are the bad guys and we're I stuck could in the see, middle. I could see that being the case and then you get a background information where Umbrella Corps yeah. either went out, to biz, out of business or, or swapped allegiance and are now helping the BSAA for reasons unexplained. But yeah, actually that might be kind of cool. That revelation at the end, I literally, my mouth dropped open. Like I was mm. like, what? <laughs> I, I like At that point, I was pretty... Oh, I was overcome with emotions. So like... I at first glance I like just looked over it. I was like, and then I heard, like I think, oh yeah, I I heard like so, someone say something, and then there was another statement. So I went, wait, what? <laughs> and I look at my screen. I was like, what? <laughs> what yeah. is happening? Yeah. yeah, it was. 
Man, that was wild. That was crazy. It's funny because it does feel like Seven in that way where they were like, look, it's a blue umbrella. And everyone goes, wait, what? This time they've gone, look, it's a BSA zombie. Everyone goes, what? <laughs> and I thought that was quite funny. All right, let's... Chris, um, Chris has just... started his own Metal Gear Solid group. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hound Wolf, uh, your former unit and one I was commander of. Um, <laughs> I want to allay a serious fear I have, though. Um, I know there's obviously murmurs of always wanting Wesker back. Mm-hmm. If this all boils down to using the Mega My Seat as a resurrection factory for sunglasses, man, I'm going to pop off big time. Yeah, like, no, it, you and me both. Podcast is cancelled. <laughs> 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 I don't think that can happen. So that, uh, That's a huge plot hole, though. Uh, you know, um... And Is there's it obviously like the Mega Mighty of asset reuse um, regarding Chris's, Chris's face, model right. and the BSAA model. I'm not sure where to sit with that yet. But if it, like, I'm not a big fan of clones. I don't think any of us are. I feel we should touch on it though. Um, it would make sense in universe that Chris is probably one of the best at killing bio weapons. So if they wanted to mass produce soldiers, but. Mm-hmm. I hope that's not the case. I I agree with Muzu in chat who says bring Alex Wesker back. Yes. <laughs> I prefer that. I think in terms yes, of the please. Wesker thing, um, I'm pretty sure it's explicitly stated that for the Mega My Seat to store somebody's memories and be able to bring them back, they need to have interacted with it. I'm pretty sure Miranda says that they she went and got Eva's body because it has right. to be people who died in the village. So I don't think oh, that can be done. But, so, like, but you know, ten, ten, TSX Machina. Yeah. Tends to be like Resident Evil Fair is like if this did happen or they want to like kind of point towards it, that you'd see images like of this and like there's no Weskers in those images in Miranda's lab mm. in fact I'm very curious about who those people are like I who think, all those people are the, I think those, Spencer yeah I think right? the photos around no Spencer's note are probably Spencer and his team doing their little uh, historical walk through Romania or whatever they were doing to wind up there um, and I think the other photos is probably the connections to be honest because it's got Miranda as a scientist standing next to a girl, which I don't think is Eva. I think it's Evelyn, and she's there to support them in the production of that, which obviously went wrong in the end. But that's my personal theory, anyway. I mean, there's those photos isn't in the lab with Mar- with Miranda, Evelyn. Mia, yeah, those. Yeah. Oh, is it? Is it? Oh, okay, also- right. I figured one of them was Mira. I didn't realize. I'd have to have a closer look. Yeah, so uh, on the far right, there's also Barry Burton or not no, Barry it's Alan. Burton. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah, it's, that picture is an RE7 too. It's just Miranda would have been scrubbed out in black. It's it's oh, it's okay. uh, it's her colleague who dies in the flashback on the boat, Alan. So it's not Barry. It's not. Barry. I promise it's not Barry. It looks, I, I, it I will turn in my like status Barry. card if it's Barry Burton. Okay. <laughs> it looks a lot like Barry, Steve. <laughs> <sighs> All right, let's let's wrap this up. This has been a hell of a podcast. Uh, so now we got to ask the big questions. Final thoughts and conclusions on Village. How does it compare to RE7? Where does it sit in terms of your favourites? With no extreme definitive answer because we are only a week out. So Adam, how do you feel about Village? Sort of on a final note, a conclusion. How does it stack up versus obviously... I mean, a week in, I still can't really find anything right. wrong with it. Is it and I, the is shine it, will wear off a little bit. Mm. I is it, it is will. it going to be really hard to sort of like I'm not putting anyone on the spot with this and like you have to give me but is it like top five material or, or do you have definitely no idea? top five nice oh. definitely yeah. just based on the the gameplay experience mm-hmm. I can detach myself from anything but the gameplay experience and I still want to play the game I still enjoy you know the way it functions. My big issues are really just like qualms about like like we were talking about treasures being locked out for you and stuff, which is annoying. But once you've kind of got them all, like whatever. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it's just as a gameplay experience, and the fact that it made me revisit Seven in a different light, not a massively different light, but to know like oh, Jack Baker killed Ethan. Like, because I, during Seven, I was always like, why is Jack bothering with Ethan? Or, like, why is anyone bothering with these people? Just like any Resident Evil game, I guess. I'm always like, why is this person so special? Mm-hmm. Um, but, but it makes you look back and go, 
you weren't special. Jack Baker killed tons of people, <laughs> and he killed you as well. Mm. It was just part of his day. He nonchalantly kills a policeman. He nonchalantly kills you. You're just the same to him. But the difference is, is you've been infected in a certain way thanks to your genetics, I guess, by this superior like mold. It's it's fascinating. I think it's going to be interesting to go back and play through seven. Yeah. And see yeah. if I can't see any foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to go back to things like once, you know, like when I went back and, and replayed and, and lady D was like, Oh, your blood's a bit stout. I was like, Oh, I get it because you, you're dead. Like before I was just like, Oh yeah, whatever. Like the mold or, mm. but very interesting. Yeah. Uh, James, I have a feeling I know what your answer is going to be, but lay it on us. How, what do you think of Village overall? Uh, so in regards to what you said, uh, so Resident Evil 7 and Resident Evil Village are one in the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's why they wanted to keep to the Village game name instead of naming it the eighth title, because it's a continuation to RE7, and they wanted that vision to be recognized, so... Uh, these two guy, th these two games, games, <laughs> these two games, two games are as important as each other in terms of the story. Uh, but if you're making me choose, like personally, um, in terms of my enjoyment of RE Village, this is my favorite game of Resident Evil, bar none other game. Mm -hmm. It's opened up so much for me and allowed me to stretch my law noggin as well. <laughs> And I'm very grateful to the game for that. So well done, Catcom. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say for my final verdict. I, I, it's it's the best, so I can't really give like a rating. Yeah, no, that's fair. Do you know, I think that like that is an opinion I can completely understand. I can completely see lots of people saying that this is their favorite game. It offers so much. There was so much hype, and I think it's sort of. Uh, it's it, man. It's it's really stood up to a lot of that hype and said, "Yeah, I am as good as you want me to be." Um, and especially in your particular case, it bears repeating because I imagine, I mean, well, props to anyone that's made it all the way to this point. If this is your first episode of First Aid Spray, welcome. Um, it's also bears repeating that James is quite a new fan of the franchise, um, and this is your first like brand new game ever, isn't it? Yeah. As a fan, so. Like that, I can absolutely understand that as well because it, it must be kind of like a special thing now over the last few years going through all the games and having this brand new one as the first your game. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah. Like it's not my game, but yeah, it's like a it's it's because there's always a game that in any kind of game franchise that brought you in, right? I mean, right. Mass it's going to be special. Mass Effect Two. Some people, you know, with Dragon Age, it's like Dragon Age Origins or. Or Inquisition. Yeah, this is that game for me. This is mm -hmm. that game that... Yes, that's yes. what I mean, yeah. I mean, I loved Resident Evil anyway. Like, Steve and all of you folks, like, you have so much pa passion for it. And I'm a feeder of passion. And I love to, to feel that around me. But this is just, like, reignited. Well, not really. That's a bad word. This is... Ignited fervor. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, it's fanned the flames, mm. I guess. Yeah. Um, for the franchise for me, yeah. Yeah, there you go. You 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 made sense of what I was trying to say at least. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, for me, it's it's a tough one. It really is. Um, it's hard to compare it with Seven because they are they're quite different in their own ways. One's much more of a horror game, much more of an action game. I think Seven, and I've said for a long time that Seven's in my top three. So it's like a it's like a this is a big deal question. I don't think Village supersedes it for me but that's just a personal taste thing i still think it's an a tier resident evil game absolutely um and as i say anyone that puts it right at the tippity top i can 100 percent agree why i'm having a lot of fun even though i played it all week and i'm gonna keep because i need to get these damn mercenary maps done um i just i think it's a wonderful gameplay experience mm -hmm. aesthetically it's brilliant uh, as i said just previously i really really like the fact that it's a sequel and it, it what it does for building on top of seven uh yeah it, it's it's really really good it'll be interesting to see where it lands over time but it's right right up there steve final thoughts on village where does it rank uh, if you can i mean no pressure of course 
And I say that I'm still waiting for the dust to settle. I, uh, of I can say unequivocally that if, if people were worried if this was going to just be Resident Evil 4 in first person, it is not. I don't think. I think it's its own beast. It takes bits from RE7, RE1, RE2, and RE4. I think in a way it plays yeah. and behaves. Just because it has a merchant doesn't immediately mean it's like Leon's first forays into that lonely and rural part of Europe. I um, I enjoy it, like like everyone else on the podcast. And it's not just because it's a Resident Evil game. I've not been able to put this down. Um, people complain that it's got a 11-hour runtime and that's it. That might be your first playthrough, but that doesn't mean you're going to stop playing. 100%. There's a lot to chew on. Uh, the active performances, I honestly think, are they, they vary. They vary, not in a bad way, but some come across as theatrical and some across as uh, very emotional. And uh, it's one of the few times where a game has made me cry. And I think that deserves a amount of praise. If I was to rank it against the guest of games of the franchise, it's a little too early to call it, but I think saying at least... At least in the upper echelons, you know, we're not we're not mm. talking like a uh, Operation Raccoon City or anything like that. This is this is definitely in like you know the, your Resident Evil remake, Resident Evil Two tier, somewhere around there for me. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's fair. It's a solidly well made game. It's fun to play, and despite the fact that I'm pretty sure out of everyone else on the podcast, I've had the most things to complain about. Um, yeah, good times though. Uh, Make sure to have some spare underwear on hand for the Beneviento house. <laughs> Good advice. Um, yeah. Get, get I, your nappy on. <laughs> I said earlier that um, Resident Evil 4 isn't necessarily uh, quite as high up my list as it is everyone else's. But I think if I'm going to dig into something for just a fun, action-y gameplay experience, it's pretty much going to be village i think uh it's right up there anyway in terms of replaying just just for the fun of shooting stuff and wandering around the environment is it stands up and just to end just it was worth saying and i know we've said this in previous episodes this is what are we on the fifth game in the last four years for the series Seven, two, three, Resistance, Village, and obviously Reverse coming soon, and I know some of them aren't necessarily developed in-house by Capcom Dev 1, but all of those games of... I mean, Resistance is obviously a bit more of a controversial one. We enjoyed it, generally, um, but everything else, uh, uh, you know, at the very least, like, good, great... In terms great, of single-player content. Right, good... Yeah, the single-player games, there you go. Good, great, or better. Uh, they've really been smashing it out of the park. It's incredible that yet again uh, Capcom have done it with Resident Evil and proves that we are in the new golden era almost of the series with so many massive successes with not just remakes but also taking the series forward um, in interesting ways. So well done to Capcom on what I am sure is going to be a huge success when we get further sales numbers um, over the next few weeks, over the next few months. Because, uh, yeah, look out RE7. I think Village is coming for you. <laughs> Nothing else remains for me but to thank our contributors. If you'd like to be part of the show, then please look into auditioning for our file readings. Join the Discord server to get in touch with members of the team and our community. Discuss Resident Evil with us and other fans and listen to the podcast live as it's recorded. You can find a link to the server as well as our Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube and more at fasprayPod.com. You can find the podcast on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify and iTunes and if you enjoyed the show, please do leave us a review where you can. It helps spread the word. You can also support Support the show by picking up some merch or at patreon.com forward slash FA Spray Pod for as little as $1 a month. In our next episode, we return to Raccoon City in written form as we relive the nights and the events of Resident Evil 2 from the mind of S.D. Perry in Book Club, City of the Dead. Thank you to the panel. You can follow all of the Pueblo people individually. I'm at Sunniac underscore 123. Steve is at FB Steve was taken. Adam is at AdVicar01. And James is at Moist Outlet OFF. And finally, thank you for listening and have a good week. I hate I hate the game to be honest. Yeah, uh, bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I hate it. Yeah. So uh, I'm retiring as host of the podcast because I can't deal with another game like this. <laughs> <laughs>
Man, I'm so excited to talk about a book that's only going to take us an hour by comparison. 